Pain is probably one of the most common presentations in general surgery, so it's really important to understand well. Unfortunately, pain is another noun that we've got to remember a nice succinct definition for. It is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. We can split pain up into two different types, especially in general surgery. Somatic pain is a pain that we're very familiar with if for instance we hit our finger with a hammer. The pain is accurately sensed in terms of its position and is also often felt as a sharp sensation. Autonomic pain, however, travels with the autonomic nervous system and is felt as a vague location and is often described as more of an ache as well as colicky pains. These are visceral pains transferred by the autonomic nervous system. It is also worth noting that visceral pain is often also accompanied by other autonomic symptoms such as nausea and sweating. So our patients can complain of somatic as well as autonomic pain. Now if we consider somatic pain first of all, our patient with appendicitis may complain of right iliac fossa. This is because the parietal peritoneum is being touched by the inflamed appendix and the parietal peritoneum has somatic sensory innervation. So the patient will localize this pain very well to the area of skin overlying this part of parietal peritoneum. Probably fortunately for us, our internal organs do not sense somatic pain and only this autonomic pain which is actually derived from stretch fibers. Now where these autonomic pains from visceral stretch are sensed in the abdomen depends entirely upon the embryological origin of the viscera affected. The embryological gut is split up into foregut, midgut and hindgut. The foregut is all of the viscera supplied by the celiac axis and this is the esophagus, stomach, first part of the duodenum and half of the second part of the duodenum up to where the major duodenal papilla enters the second part of the duodenum. So this is foregut and it's sensed in the epigastrium. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and stretches all of the way from the second part of the duodenum to the distal third of the transverse colon. So it includes all of the small bowel as well as a lot of the colon including the vermiform appendix. Stretch in all of these organs will be sensed as pain in the periumbilical region. So therefore our patient with appendicitis, before even getting pain in his right iliac fossa from the tip touching the parietal peritoneum, will complain of periumbilical colicky abdominal pain. The hindgut, being supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery, is much shorter portion of colon and stretches from the distal third of the transverse colon to the rectum and we sense visceral pain from the hindgut in the suprapubic area. So when eliciting a pain history I find the mnemonic Socrates very helpful. The first S is for sight. Where exactly is the pain? If the pain is abdominal then we want to know if the pain is around the umbilicus or is it above it or below it. This gives us an idea of whether the pain is foregut, midgut or hindgut in origin. If the pain is also off to one side this may give us more of a clue such as the right upper quadrant pain in cholecystitis or the left iliac fossa pain of diverticulitis. Onset refers to the circumstances around the start of the pain does the patient think they can link it to anything? What are they doing at the time? And the day before, were they asleep? If a pain wakes someone up, 
if it's quite severe, but the patient may equally simply wake up with it. The character of the pain is quite important. There are loads of different descriptors for types of pain, and you should try and let your patient come up with their own. Common ones include the burning pain of dyspepsia or dysuria, the stabbing pains of pancreatitis, the crushing pains of myocardial ischemia, and the colicky pains from a hollow viscous in spasm, such as renal calculi and gallstones. Pain may also change in character, like that in acute appendicitis, the initial colic, to a more localised, sharp pain. A pain which radiates or is referred indicates the involvement of structures with differing innervation because they are, are of separate embryological origin. For example, the pain of a subphrenic abscess is referred to the shoulder. This is because the diaphragm, having developed its primary nerve supply from C345 in the phrenic nerve, tells the sensory cortex of pain in this distribution which maps to the dermatomes overlying the shoulder. The principle of radiation of pain is subtly different. Testicular pain radiates to the groins and renal colic pain radiates from the loins to the groins. This is also because of the involvement of differing innervation but the area of pain radiates out so is perceived at the origin, unlike pain that is purely referred. Don't confuse this concept with pain which migrates, such as in appendicitis. Alleviating factors sometimes shed some light onto what is actually going on. For instance, if eating food helps, sometimes this may rep represent a duodenal ulcer as opposed to a gastric ulcer which is worse on eating. If they say they're much better when lying still, this may indicate peritonitis, while if they say the pain's much better when they lean forward, this could indicate pancreatitis. Any associated symptoms are also important to inquire about and include loss of appetite or anorexia, loss of weight, dysphagia, nausea, vomiting, bloatedness or change in bowel habit, as well as PR bleeding, jaundice, fever or night sweats, pale stools, dark urine, mouth ulcers and thrush, and even any other skin lesions. Another quite obvious but important detail is timing, and by this we mean duration and frequency. The exact time period of course does not matter, but describing the length of time the patient has suffered this pain, either in minutes, hours or days, or even months, often gives a clue to the diagnosis due to the natural progression of the disease. If a pain is intermittent, the frequency of its occurrence is equally important. In colicky pain, for example, the time period between bouts is related to the frequency at which the viscous contracts. For example, the severe pain of renal colic typically, typically lasts one to two hours, with no particular triggers. That of biliary colic tends to be initiated by fatty foods and is often more short-lived. When you ask what makes the pain worse, you can often pick up on several clues of the etiology. Quite a major principle in general surgery is whether movement hurts. If a patient has peritonitis, then it will hurt if visceral peritoneum is rubbed against parietal peritoneum on movement. Other major things to consider in general surgery history are pain after eating and pain with defecation. The severity of a pain is an incredibly subjective measure, so we can't rely on this diagnostically. However, it is useful to know how strong the pain is rated in order to assess response to treatment or analgesia. The most common scoring system is describing pain as a score out of 10, Interestingly, however, evidence shows we only really group our pain into three main groups, mild, moderate and severe.